Okay, but Randy's video is now off, so someone turn oh, my it. My video's here. Oh, there you go. Okay. Too Can't much going that. on. Okay, I'm going to mute myself and. Uh, Dakota, you're going to make everyone go live? Okay, Rachel, but yep. I can't see myself. You can't see yourself? No, that's weird. No, none of us can at this point. I don't know if when they take down this annual members meeting piece, we'll be able to no see. No problem. I can see you all now. It's fine. We're fine. Thank you very much for being here, uh, Commissioner. Dakota, you ready? Yep. Yeah, we are live. Let's go. Okay. So Dakota, do you? Randy, you can start whenever you are ready. Fantastic. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, Randy Mastro, uh, chair of the CU Cuff Boards. Uh, I am honored to welcome you uh, tonight to our annual meeting and civic conversation. Uh, before we begin uh, with the conversation, I uh, need to complete a few orders of business. So we will start with a call to order and approval of the 2019 annual meeting minutes. Uh, I, I move that. Anyone second? Second. Um, uh, I will uh, take that as by acclamation that the minutes are approved. Um, now, uh, I would like to briefly address you on the important work of Citizens Union over the past year and in the years ahead. Um, I think there's never been a more important time for a good government group, nonpartisan, like Citizens Union. Um, at this moment in our history, both locally and nationally, um, the call for good government, honest government, transparent government, um, a government you know, and standards um, that cares about ethics and honesty, um, a government that encourages fair and open process, and dialogue, um, a government that respects the rule of law, a government that encourages full participation in voting, full participation in the census. Um, these are issues that uh, CU um, cares deeply about, issues that CU has championed in the past, um, and issues that we will champion in the future. Um, so you can look forward in 2020 to our, you know, our voter directories, uh, but also in 2021, our elect NYC project, where there will be literally hundreds of candidates filling the two thirds vacancies in city offices, um, including the principal office of, of mayor. Uh, it will be a consequential election at a critical time uh, in our city's history. Uh, we will continue to speak out on policing reform um, as we did in supporting the repeal of civil rights law, section 50A, so that records of police officers you know, can uh, be seen and are transparent to the public when there are uh, issues involving uh, use of force. Uh, and we are gonna continue to speak out uh, and do uh, our best on the census so that there is a fair and accurate count um, and we will, for the first time in the 125 year history of this organization, um, our board uh, has committed to uh, endorsing in the uh, presidential race, and you'll be hearing more about that uh, later in the fall. Um, but these are the most consequential elections, 2000 and 2001, in our nations and our cities and our state's histories. We're at a critical crossroads, having weathered the storms of the coronavirus and having supported ways to encourage voting and access to voting, even in uh, the midst of a pandemic. Um, seeing New York do pioneering work in that regard, um, while it has you know, dealt both with the tragedy um, and the comeback 
uh, from the worst of the pandemic. Uh, Citizens Union has been there to support those principles in government that we hold most dear. Um, so I want to thank each and every one of you for being supporters and members of Citizens Union. I want to welcome you to this annual board meeting um, and say um, thank you. Uh, the hard work is ahead, but the best is yet to come. So thank you all. Uh, next, uh, before we get into our conversation, um, we have some uh, important things that we need to do. We need to elect uh, CU board members to the class of 2022, Evan A. Bishop and Jim Walden, and to the class of 2023, Cliff Shenfield, Stacy Cumberbatch, Alan Dobrin, Esther Fuchs, Charles Giglio, Gary Naftalis, Jason Stewart, and Daryl Towns. Um, so uh, now, uh, members of Citizens Union only, please vote via the poll feature. Um, uh, we will also be counting proxies. You will receive um, your uh, ballot. Vote, uh, in, check in favor if you favor the slate, opposed if you don't, and submit. Um, and please, uh, I will uh, encourage you to uh, vote now. Please do. That was so easy. Um, and I, as has been uh, the case in the past, we will uh, assume that there has been uh, an election of these uh, board members. Uh, we will let you know if uh, there was any uh, a different result, but uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, congratulations to these board members um, being up to re upped to these terms. And yes, thank we, have, you. we have gotten the votes and uh, uh, we've had more than enough votes in favor of it. So it has passed. Say, I mean, may, may uh, the results on November 3rd come as quickly. Um, now uh, I would like to introduce our treasurer, Nancy Bo, to give a b brief financial report. Nancy, take it away. Thank you, Randy. Um, hello, everybody. I hope you'll excuse me for reading my report, but I think in about 20 seconds, you're gonna understand why. Um, we are currently finishing up the audit of our 2019 financials. So the information I'm presenting is from the unaudited financial statements ending December 31st, 2019, but um, the audit is substantially done, so we don't expect any significant changes. Citizens Union in income was $319,249. Its expenses were $250,760 for an increase in net assets of $68,489. Combined with net assets at the beginning of 2019 of $145,570, we ended the year with $214,059 in unrestricted net assets. Our total assets amounted to $230,590, of which $210,356 um, were in cash. Copies of our audited financial statements will be finalized by the end of October and will be available online. Although we are not required to report the financial status of Citizens Union Foundation at this meeting, we like to be transparent about our entire operation and would like to share with you some more numbers, a brief summary of the information for the foundation. 2019 income was $1,274,000. Expenses were $1,219,000 for an increase in net assets of $55,000. Citizens Union's Foundation's unrestricted net assets as of December 31st, 2019, totaled $1,019,000. Total assets amounted to $1,137,000, of which $547,000 was in cash and 379,000 was investments. Now, I may, I've been rounding as I read to spare you some of the numbers 
Um, and so if they don't add up exactly, it's because I rounded wrong as I read. So that is my report. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Nancy. Um, and uh, I just want to say to um, everyone on the call and all of our members and our incredible, loyal, and supportive board um, that serves so well and the uh, amazing staff that we have um, and our executive director, Betsy Gutbaum, who I'll be introducing in just a minute. Um, there are many challenges ahead um, in this environment, uh, funding challenges, revenue challenges, and otherwise. Um, so we are really going to, we depend upon and we'll really be calling upon your support um, through uh, this difficult period. Um, and uh, know that we can count on you as always uh, to support the important mission of Citizens Union. Um, now normally at this time, uh, we would have a question and answer session and I would be answering uh, questions from the membership. Um, given this unique format, that is going to be more difficult. Uh, but if any member um, has a question, the member should email it to communications at citizensunion.org um, and uh, we will respond to your question. Um, and you can see on the screen right now, thank you, Ben, uh, put up the email address. Um, with that, we're, we're uh, there's a call for any new business or old business. I think we have covered the landscape uh, and uh, because we have an important conversation to get to in terms of the formal meeting. Um, I, I hereby uh, move that we adjourn uh, and move to the civic conversation. Um, Nancy Bo, I'm sure is seconding me. And, I am, yes, I'm just muted, but yes, I second the motion. <laughs> and um, I'm going to assume that's all in favor. So thank you and we're gonna move on to the civic conversation, but first, let me introduce uh, our uh, great executive director, Betsy Gottbaum, um, who's gonna make her own introduction of our keynote speaker. Um, Betsy uh, is you know, someone uh, very dear to so many of us um, who love city government, her service over many years, parks commissioner, public advocate, and now as executive director of CU, um, she's just, uh, one of those uh, Gotham greats that we, uh, we honor. So we're honored to have her as our executive director. Um, and Betsy, uh, take it away for an introduction of tonight's keynote speaker. Oh, it makes me uh, extremely happy and proud to be able to introduce our keynote speaker, who is uh, Ben Tucker. I just, uh, his resume is so long that I, I, there's no point in going into it, it's so long. I mean, he's got everything from being a, a lawyer to deputy commissioner to having worked in Washington. But I know Ben because way, way, way back when I was the uh, executive director of the Police Foundation, um, I did a program, I was doing a program and Ben was very helpful where we got bulletproof vests for every police officer in the city of New York, paid for by private citizens, school children, private citizens. And Ben was extremely helpful in that endeavor. That was in the late 70s, I think, Ben. And then 50 years later, I'm at an event, and who comes up to remind me of how many lives were saved as a result of that program? So that's my great connection with Ben Tucker, who I introduced now, who uh, I guess, Rick, you're going to take it away too. But Ben, thank you very much for doing this and good evening. Oh, good evening, Betsy. Thank you for, for that great introduction. And uh, Randy, it's a pleasure uh, as well. So, and Rick, looking forward to the conversation. Uh, I, uh, Commissioner, a lot of could, you un, un, uh, could you turn on your video? I'm so sorry. It's okay. I, I tried it twice and I thought you might be controlling it. So I didn't. Uh, let me there we go. It Perfect. Okay. Did, did it pop up? Yep. There we go. Okay, great. So again, uh, Betsy, thanks. Thanks for the introduction and, uh, and also for the long friendship uh, over these many, this, these many years and, and, and especially for the uh, invite to, to, uh, 
to spend some time with you and, and the members of CU this evening. So, uh, Rick, um, how do you want to start? Can I just, uh, you know, take a few minutes and... Sure. I, uh, the, the format was that I was going to ask you some questions for a while, and then I was going to take questions that people are sending in. Uh, but if you'd like to start with a little introduction, the floor is yours. Well, you know, well, why don't you, you what I was going to do, and, 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 and the reason I, I even thought about it this way is because, uh, you know, one of the questions that I, I, I believed you were going to ask had to do with policing and, and is it better now or how has it changed over the years? Well, uh, I'll lead you and, right, I'll lead you right so, into that, Ben. Uh, okay. So let, let me, let me so get that, started. This my, yeah. first, my first question is, um, uh, but for, first let me thank you for agreeing to do this. It's, it's really an honor uh, to have you with us and to be able to uh, engage in this conversation with you. Um, and uh, uh, so let's get rolling. Um, there's been much criticism in uh, recent years of the NYPD and especially in the past six months, and we'll get to some of that criticism presently. Uh, but first of all, why don't you tell us the ways in which you view uh, the police department as having improved in recent years? Okay, so um, uh, uh, from my perspective, you know, it, it is, yeah, it, NYPD has had some challenges. And so I'll begin by just saying the, the only reason I'm back at the NYPD in many ways, and I left, I left the Obama administration to come back as I watched uh, Mayor de Blasio uh, make his appointments after his, his, his election and, 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 uh, and inauguration. And, and just to, uh, he brought back Bill Bratton, he, 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 Zach Carter, uh, a bunch of folks that I know uh, from, from uh, for, for, for a very long time and, and the people that I saw that he was appointing, I was, I was encouraged, really encouraged by, by that. And uh, I was also from my perch down in, at, at the drug policy office, watching what was happening here in New York uh, at NYPD. And I started in NYPD in, in 1969 as a trainee. I loved the department. I, I spent my career trying to make improvements and influence some of the the policies but also trying to change people's uh, minds about young black men who uh, at, uh who grew up in bed -Stuy and 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 in communities where you know men of color uh grew up were not treated very well um and the response by police back back then uh you know i was one of those folks who was stopped and frisked by by police and so the, the notion and, and and the idea that i actually became a police officer and joined the department was was a surprise to me in some ways uh but the truth is it, now i'm i couldn't be more pleased that i that i took that path because i, I think i was able to have um uh, some influence and and in this current position uh, as a number two at NYPD, I, I, I do have um, some input. So as I watch the, the challenges with stop and frisk and the, uh, the judges are ruling uh, in the uh, class action uh, suits um, and, and the, the desire to really move ahead um, and to move away from the numbers driven policing that led to the almost 700,000 stops of black and brown young men uh, uh, for about a decade. And, uh, and I think uh, Mayor de Blasio, uh, when he s decided to settle these, these actions and to um, embrace the, um, the court order and, and work with uh, the, the monitor, the federal monitor, that was for me, um, uh, a good news. And, and so, so that is, uh, what I was watching at the time. And then I got a phone call from Bill Bratton's office uh, asking if I had an interest in coming back. And Bill as, as the new police commissioner. Uh, and I, I asked the gentleman who called me, Bob Wasserman, and I said, well, what, what, is, what does Bill want me to do? And he, he, he said, he wants you to run training. So that's, that, that's how I, you know, I came up, I met with Bill. Uh, he had a real vision for what he wanted to accomplish as many of you on this call, no doubt. Uh, no, that was his second time now as police commissioner uh, uh, in, in New York City. 
and um, and and he was really instrumental in influencing policing in, in innovative ways uh, his first time around in the creation of Comstat, uh, as, as well as um, really the focus, the heart of that that notion of constant Comstat really focused on accountability and management and improvements in those areas, but also numbers driven. Uh, policing was out and and was very much uh, uh, part of an evidence-based problem-solving approach to policing that grew out of uh, the reform era um, and especially out of the office uh, uh, the 1994 crime bill which created the office of, uh, of community-oriented policing services in the Clinton uh, White House and at the Justice Department and so I was part of that initial um, uh, creation and, and had the opportunity to be uh, part of building that office and, and hiring the 100,000 additional officers that the uh, president was interested in, in bringing on board. And, and crime was, was still just about leveling off, but had been uh, uh, significantly impacting cities around the country. And I will say that uh, just in 90, 1990, uh, we had 2,245 people murdered in, in New York City. And I don't know, some of you may recall that and how bad things were. Um, but uh, what we were able to bring those numbers down uh, over, over time um, as part of some of the efforts that we, that we engaged in, uh, especially uh, under Bill Bratton's uh, uh, watch. And so I came back and his focus was on training, especially uh, we, we opened a brand new police academy for the first time in 50 years. Uh, we were still using the old academy on 20th Street, uh, and it was, you know, really inadequate uh, for uh, the challenges around 21st century policing and, and, and what we needed to accomplish. And so uh, that made a difference. And, and so that's, that's we, we, we moved into our own reform era uh, at, by Bratton, the first thing that he did was conduct a re-engineering process, which gave voice, voices to um, uh, every member of the police, uh, police department. 55,000 members, both uniform and civilian, had the opportunity to make recommendations uh, for changes that they were interested in seeing uh, come about. And uh, that process yielded about 1,300 uh, recommendations, which led to about 800 of those recommendations, some of which were of the 13 were, were duplicates. And so we ended up um, implementing those, 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 those recommendations. But one of the things that's unique about that was it didn't know, uh, but it, I think it gave them the ability to feel as though they had the opportunity uh, to influence uh, what the leadership of that agency uh, would do. Uh, in, in the way in which it ran uh, the, the department. So the emphasis in, in those changes at that time uh, in 2014 and, and, and since that, that, that day, uh, that month, uh, early in February when I came back, uh, I, I started out as the Deputy Commissioner for Training. We opened a new academy in 2015. Uh, we created, uh, we moved away from uh, the numbers driven policing uh, and, and, and had our officers now having to have uh, field training, which didn't exist under the prior administration. So things weren't, weren't good. They were sending, I realized after I was there for a brief period, we had roughly 11,000 officers who, who graduated from the police academy during that period. Um, and they were never taught really uh, and educated uh, to be uh, full, 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 fully trained police officers. And they were put on street corners and told to get the numbers. So that was the atmosphere that, that existed. Uh, and we, we, we quickly, quickly began to move away from, from that, um, that approach um, and, and to have our officers trained properly uh, and, um, and to engage the community in that process uh, by recruiting uh, volunteers to be what we call community partners to help educate our officers when they arrived at the precincts where they were going to be assigned upon graduation from the from the academy so so but then the the, the agenda that we that we took uh, and, and 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 worked on 
feverishly focused in, in, in key areas, focused on training for sure, uh, which is always critical to almost anything that we were able to, to accomplish, uh, but also focused on, on, on technology, focused on tactics. Uh, in, in July of 2014, as you all may remember, uh, Mr. Garner died as a result of the chokehold applied by one of our officers. And, uh, and that was a game changer for us. And I had to pivot immediately when that event took place uh, because the issue for me and the academy were, was really training and, and had a conversation with Commissioner Bratton at the time. And Bill and I concluded that we really needed to, re we realized that, train, that tactics was a perishable skill. And, and once someone went through our basic recruit curriculum, in the academy and graduated, unless they went to a specialized unit sometime down the road, uh, they never received any tactical training, so to speak, uh, in any uh, uh, substantive way uh, thereafter. And so we trained, uh, we added three days to the training curriculum and, and, um, and, and, and that became one of, you know, we trained all 22,000 of the officers who were working on patrol ultimately. And, and that those annual, those three days are now um, included in the two days of firearms training. So we have a net increase to three days uh, for a total of five days of required in-service training for every police officer um, throughout their career. So that was, I think, a monumental um, task, but it was well worth it because I think we now train um, I believe we train our officers better than, than, uh, than they've ever been trained before in a variety of areas. Uh, and we've done that pretty consistently over these past several years. Uh, so training uh, technology, we've embraced it uh, completely. Uh, we put uh, smartphones in the hands of every police officer, uh, all 36,000. Those smartphones give them access to all the databases that uh, would would, would, they would normally not have access to without going into a, a police facility. And, and we gave, we, that, that those phones helped us actually reduce response time uh, for calls and service uh, coming through 911 because the data, once the 911 call is placed uh, and comes in, it, uh, it shows up on the officer's phones in the precinct, in the sector where they're working and uh, they can begin the response even before the dispatcher dispatches them to the job. And so, so technology in, 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 it has been uh, something we've cared about from, from uh, throughout these six and a half, seven years. Uh, Body One cameras uh, was, um, were introduced um, and required by uh, one of the remedial measures uh, that the federal uh, judge required us to do was, was uh, to, to do a pilot uh, uh, with um, using, using body-worn cameras. We did the pilot uh, and Peter Zimroff and his team are evaluating it, but, um, but Commissioner Bratton and I decided that we were going to continue to, to assign body-worn body cameras and, and uh, did a procurement so that we could begin in earnest because we believed in the efficacy of, of the cameras for, for lots of reasons. Um, uh, certainly transparency, but also to address some of the concerns that uh, communities throughout the city had, in particular communities of color. So we believe that it would be uh, help, and it has been. Uh, we now have 25,000 of our officers, both uh, uniform and, and um, anti-crime when they were, when they existed, wearing body-worn cameras as well as supervisors. So that, that has helped, but the, the, comp the, 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 the in addition to uh, cameras and smartphones, uh, other shot spotter technology to, you know, which are sensors uh, that pick up gunshots and so forth, uh, license plate readers, and all of that type of, of technology has, has been effective in giving us the ability to be, uh, move away from numbers driven policing and be much more precise in our, in our, in how we police communities and uh, gave us the opportunity to really uh, identify those uh, violent um, uh, offenders who were, were the small percentage of people who, who were really wreaking havoc in, in communities across the city. So we've been very effective, so much so that we brought crime down to the lowest numbers, uh, even, th even though our footprint on, on enforcement activities uh, shrunk dramatically in the number of arrests that we were making, 
uh, but the rest that we were making were very effective and, and the prosecutions were also uh, effective as well and we were putting people away. So the ones who deserve to be inside as opposed to walking the streets in our communities. So it's worked out, uh, that worked out well. And, and uh, so the numbers, we, we brought crime down con continuously to the lowest it's ever been in the history uh, of the department uh, since the 1950s. Uh, in that process, uh, those numbers, that data continued to be, uh, uh, the numbers continued to, to support that until, until recently this year. The other thing that we did was focus on, and I think many of our citizens out there and some of the voices and the critics uh, uh, of late, uh, when, they, when they speak about policing, they tend to forget, I think, because they never mention it, uh, but they don't realize the impact of, of, of what 9-11 um, uh, and those planes uh, flying into, into the buildings really meant. Uh, and the truth is those threats still remain uh, and, um, and we continue uh, uh, our efforts uh, to thwart any attacks that take place. So we really uh, also uh, created what we call the Critical Response Command and another uh, command called the Strategic uh, strategic response group, which in effect allows us to have uh, officers trained specifically um, in in um, in, in um, counterterrorism tactics, uh, as well as um, uh, you know uh, M4 rifles, uh, and um, in, the, in almost uh, just over 500 officers in the critical response command, and another 800 officers in the um, strategic response group uh, equipped to to respond uh, along with our emergency services unit. So we tr almost tripled uh, the capacity. Uh, we have close to a thousand, uh, 2,000 officers that allow us to respond at any given moment uh, anywhere in the city to, uh, to counterterrorism uh, uh, threats that uh, uh, to deal with uh, threats that, that, uh, that, that we are become aware of. So uh, it's the progress has been steady. It has been very focused. Uh, it is it is it is focused on crisis intervention training. Uh, there's a lot to talk about our response and whether we should be responding to uh, mentally people who have mental illness uh, to those types of jobs. Um, but um, that crisis intervention training has has helped immeasurably uh, in in terms of uh, co response. We have when it comes to uh, responding to certain types of jobs, particularly with mentally ill or, or with the homeless uh, population uh, where we have um, trained uh, health uh, partnership with, with the Department of uh, Mental Health, uh, Health and Mental Hygiene and our officers uh, working together and responding to jobs. Uh, it's, it's not as comprehensive as we would like, but, but it has been effective in providing uh, a response that is that, that fits the needs of the individuals who need that, that those services. And we can together responding, keep people safe, but also through the mental health um, uh, services, get people what they need. So th that's just a snapshot of, of where we are. Uh, our training continues. We focused on implicit bias. Uh, we focused on de-escalation. We rewrote our use of force policies. We brought in um, a, a, a panel of experts to, to look at our disciplinary process and to make recommendations uh, uh, with people that have, have you know, who, have, who understand uh, the criminal justice process. Uh, and those recommendations have been implemented uh, in, over, over the past year. So, so we've been very proactive at trying to be transparent uh, even notwithstanding 50A prior to its repeal, we were in the process of finding ways to come as close to the line as we could to, to post uh, information on our trial decisions uh, and settlements. Uh, and now all of that will happen uh, you know, uh, as, as time goes on. Uh, uh, but the commitment was there even before uh, there, was, uh, there, there was any action um, by, the, um, by the legislature. So, I'll leave it there, uh, and Rick, and, uh, but I wanted to give you that perspective. Um, I think by and large, our recruitment efforts have also been effective uh, in bringing, uh, increasing the diversity of, of, the, of the police department as well. 
Thank you, Ben. Uh, ben, at the center of much of the discussion about policing these days is the need to make the police more accountable. And at the center of that discussion is often the need to improve the process by which police officers are disciplined. I'd like to ask you several questions about that. Uh, first, in New York City, the CCRB, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, is a critical institution with respect to police discipline. However, the NYPD sometimes appears to be resistant to CCRB's request for relevant information to conduct its investigations. NYPD plays significant obstacles in the way of prompt disclosure of the video taken by cam body cameras. It is delayed production of do some documents and often redacted what appears to be material information. And uh, for months, it did nothing to require police officers to appear for hearings conducted online during the pandemic. Would you like to comment on, on why the, NP, the NYPD appears to be so slow in responding to the CCRB and what you think the NYPD owes the CCRB in the way of timely cooperation with its investigations? Actually, Rick, that's a great question because I, I, you know some of what you said I think is inaccurate. Um, and so I would say that, that um, over time, I mean, I, you, know, I, you know, I ran the CCRB when it was inside the, the, the police department. So I, I understand why their role is so critical and that they are indeed, when it comes to discipline um, and, 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 and getting information from the public to, to address the complaints that the citizens have, uh, that, that, is, that is, we are at work in tandem as part of that process. It doesn't have, it has to be legitimate and it has to, it has to exist. And I was pleased to know that it was um, moved uh, back in the 90s, I guess it was, when we moved it out, out of the NYPD and, and created it as a standalone uh, uh, entity. Uh, and since that time, since I've come back, uh, we've been, I oversee discipline among many other issues at the department, but that is one of my responsibilities. And so we've worked with Richard Emery when he was there initially, and, and then others since then, Maya Wiley and others, um, and we've spent a lot of time trying, we trained some of their investigators, we gave access, um, and we've tried to, to continue to try and make that the case. And I thought we were making, and I think we have made progress uh, in working with, with, uh, with, with folks uh, at, the, at the agency. The, the, the issue around body-worn cameras, um, we make that, that information available, uh, and, and we have not, you know, we, we, we worked out an MOU with them. That MOU uh, is intact. Uh, we recently, in, in the last, I guess, a little less than a year before COVID, uh, we're in the process of setting up uh, a separate SCIF, if you will, uh, in, in, a, in a separate facility so that we could make the videos available to the investigators uh, in, that, in that space so that they could get and see what, uh, get what they needed uh, from our video, from the body one camera videos that, uh, that they were interested in, in reviewing. And that process is still going forward. The, the thing that hasn't happened yet for, for reasons that I think everyone knows um, is the space has not been completed. Uh, but that, is, that was the intent. Uh, we worked it out. We had meetings with John Dosh and the rest of the team over there to work those those processes through, and so uh, that will happen. Uh, and um, you know, there's no reason for us to to withhold that information, uh, but we do have um, you know our own requirements, and 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 we have to protect the integrity of of, uh, of the video, but also. Um, we have to worry about issues of sealed records and that sort of thing. So this, and that's why we created the skip so that we can make sure that they get what they need, however much they need um, in real time uh, as they as they conduct their investigations. Uh, so, so the, and, and so for me and, and, and uh, my team, uh, we have worked with them to, to to, to view the cases. Um, the process, I think, is, is pretty seamless. Um, but I also think that, that there was some time will be, sometimes will be disagreement with respect to the outcome or the recommendations that come from, uh, 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 from CCRB with regard to a particular case. 
And so to the extent that we disagree, we, at some point a few years back, uh, under a prior, the, the prior department advocate, we worked on a process where we could, you know, send the, send the case back for review um, and they would and give them an, uh, a, a, a rationale for why we disagreed with a particular uh, decision that uh, that was made. So I think um, you know, it is not perfect. I also do think that, and I've been concerned about, uh, you know, the fact that that you know, if you are a member of the board uh, at CCRB, then I think uh, it should be you have an obligation uh, not to be an advocate, but rather an objective reviewer of the facts. And I didn't get the sense that that was always the case, uh, depending on, on on you know one case or another. And so I think, you know, we have to figure out and, and it's, in, it's incumbent up, uh, on us as the NYPD, but it's also incumbent upon Fred Davies and the team at CCRB to really, um, you know, come to the, to the table uh, and, and do the job um, and do it effectively. Uh, and I actually believe, uh, I didn't realize that, that people who serve on the board are not, they don't take an oath. And I believe they should take an oath so that there's a reminder that, that this is, uh, that if you have that job and you have that role, then that role is important. And, um, and you need to, um, you know, have, take, raise your hand and say that I, you know, whatever you're swearing to, but, but I think that's, you know, we have to be even handed in our dealings and, and that, that, that sometimes doesn't appear to be the case. Well, then the, the police department turns over automatically videos and documents to the DA's office without any editing or redaction. Why shouldn't the same be true for the CCRB? And if the police department isn't willing to do it, why shouldn't it be done by legislation? Well, I, it, it, well Rick, I think we legislate a little bit too much. Um, we can get stuff done with policy. What CCRB needs and with respect to the videos, they, they will get. And, and to the extent that we've gone in the past, they have gotten it. Uh, DAs, we, we had to, we made a direct connection with them. They can't process arrests um, and make decisions about what the prosecution, whether the case is going forward or not without the data. So we make that happen and we've, we've had to make it happen from the very beginning. Otherwise this whole process of body one cameras wouldn't, wouldn't have been effective. Um, that, that this is, in my view, this is not going to be an obstacle, uh, nor should it be, uh, for CCRB to, to have access uh, when they're sitting in that skiff to see the, the, the videos that they need to see. Um, but they also, you know, we can't, depending on the cases, there are, there are sealed records in some instances, depending on what we're talking about. So, but I think we've always come to the table trying to figure out if there are gaps, if there's something that's not working well, to, to, to figure out how we fix it. And, and that's still my, that's still my, uh, you know, my position on it. And, um, and, uh, and, and we now have a new advocate in place who I think uh, will, 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 you know, will follow that rule um, and, um, and uh, approach it from that perspective as well. And I know she's having conversations and, and does meet often with John uh, uh, and his people uh, with, uh, with that in mind. Thank you, Ben. So uh, Ben, police disciplinary cases are heard by an administrative law judge employed by the NYPD who serves at the pleasure of the commissioner or the deputy commissioner. However, the disciplinary uh, cases of all other city employees are heard by administrative law judges at the Office of Administrative Tribunals and Hearings, OATH, uh, who are independent. Why shouldn't police disciplinary cases also be conducted before OATH? Why not move it out of the police department? Well, I think it functions quite well where it is, Rick. So, so I, don't, I don't see it needing to be at OATH. <clears throat> and um, you know, we have uh, very capable uh, judges and uh, I, I think you know uh, Rosemarie Maldonado. Uh, you know you, she was an oath uh, uh, judge as well over time, and um, I, I don't know of any other person with as much integrity uh, as as she has with respect to how she does her work and her job. And the people who are judges who work for her are above reproach as well. So, um, in my view, 
uh, what we're doing and how we do the work and how it gets done, uh, gets done properly, gets done uh, within the bounds of the law and is, and is absolutely uh, uh, without above reproach when it comes to, uh, to the way in which the trials are handled uh, as well. Well, Ben, you know, I've known Rosemary for a long time, and, and the, the question is not uh, uh, directed at the uh, uh, ability or integrity of these individuals, but rather a question of perception. Uh, structurally, uh, you have judges who are uh, uh, not independent uh, of the police department. Don't you think it might improve uh, public acceptance uh, if the process was outside of the police department? Well, it, it might. I, don't, I won't deny that. Um, it, you know, from a perception uh, perspective of, of the public, it might, it might well do that. Uh, another question relating to discipline, which is sometimes raised, is uh, whether in this uh, period of, uh, uh, given the current level of distrust, um, should the police commissioner continue to have the final say uh, with respect to uh, disciplinary sanctions? Um, I'm sure you have a view of that. Why don't you share it with us? Well, you know, listen, I, I make recommendations before it goes to the police commissioner, it goes to me. And so I, I scrutinize these cases and, and I make recommendations uh, on the merits of what we see uh, and uh, what comes, you know, after the, or after, as the process goes forward. And so, uh, again, I think I think it's imperative and I think it's important that the police commissioner have the, the final say uh, on what he does uh, and the decisions that get made with respect to the personnel in the agency. The fact that, that, that you know, many people out there somehow distrust the process, there are many people who come through the process who have their cases uh, adjudicated um, and, the, and, and, and so, uh, and, and often we get, the complaints we get is, you know, people, and we get this from elected officials and, and others, uh, that people should be terminated. You know, we don't terminate enough people. Um, listen, we terminate, we have no qualms about terminating officers who engage in conduct that is, that warrants being terminated, uh, that speaks to their character or speaks to some intentional act. Those things are, are from, from my perspective, and I think certainly from the police commissioner's expect, uh, uh, perspective, uh, is, is uh, things that are dealt with um, and dealt with, I think, effectively. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I just, you know, for me, if I were the police commissioner, I would prefer, you know, prefer uh, and to have that final say uh, and uh, to be able to rule on those cases uh, and I would, you know, that, that would be my, my position. Thank you. I'm going to switch to one of the questions that I, uh, a member of our audience has, has sent in. It, it was something that was on my mind and uh, it gets us a little bit away from the particulars of the structural questions we've been discussing. And that is, you, you mentioned that until recently, uh, crime has been consistently down and uh, that is certainly uh, to the credit of the New York City Police Department. Uh, but there has been an uptick uh, particularly significant in the area of shootings. Um, would you like to share with us your view as to why uh, there has been that significant uh, increase in shootings in the city? Well, I think, you know, listen, it's hard to know exactly why, uh, but they, you know, shootings are, are up and, and, uh, and they're up significantly, as you point out. Uh, but the, you know, I can tell you that our officers are working and they're taking guns off the streets. Uh, we, you know, last last week we took 174 guns off the street. The week before that, 163. Uh, it I think it speaks to the amount of guns that are out there, and um, and and so if we have challenges. I tell you that are are you know exacerbated by the processes that are in place and whether or not we can prosecute. We're locking people up who possess guns, who have shot at people, who have shot people. Um, and um, and those 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 people are back out on the streets, uh, so um, and they're not prosecuted uh, to the fullest extent of the law. So um, that's that's a problem. And I think you know the the um, it may be that uh, that these folks feel more comfortable uh, firing weapons and carrying weapons uh, uh, because. 
uh, we are, the police are not, they don't believe the police are, are in a position to really make the arrest and make that arrest stick. Uh, and so it may be, you know, it's, it's, I think there's a, a, a combination of factors, but certainly uh, some of what we're seeing with respect to the individuals that we've arrested uh, time and again and, and remain, uh, main out, remain uh, uh, outside of the system um, is troubling. Thank you. Um, ben, it is often said that the police unions uh, are a major obstacle to reform uh, uh, in the direction of greater accountability. I've got two questions for you about the police uh, unions. Let me get them both out. Uh, first, do they have too much power over policy? And if so, what can be done to diminish it? And second, now that the police department is majority minority, what are the prospects for a change in union leadership or at least a lessening of union resistance to reforms? Well, I think, you know, unions, you know, been around a while. Uh, and uh, as you, I don't need to tell you, Rick. <laughs> and and uh, so they, they over time, uh, you know, you know, so many of, of the, the, the contracts uh, reflect some of the uh, the um, requests and and the, the wins that unions have had with respect to certain activities within the department that influence or impact on on um, on how we deal with officers in disciplinary process, as an example. Um, but um, but you know I, I think you know we're as powerful as as the unions are in New York. I, I think we are not as, as it's not as bad as it is for some other jurisdictions that i know of uh where you know they they, they have a you know the unions may have a uh a, a hold on the departments that are just untenable uh where you couldn't transfer uh, a detective without first getting the permission of, of the unions uh we don't have that problem in, in new york city uh and so yeah i i think we are we work with them uh, because it's important that we do, uh, but um, we have rules and processes in place. Uh, they follow those rules, uh, 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 and and um, and so that's our you know where we are right now. And is is we? I've said to 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 um, to the unions when 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 Jim O'Neill became police commissioner, we met with the unions unions and on, on a number of issues at their request and uh, at the end of that meeting you know I, I you know uh, 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 O'Neill said to me Ben do you, do you have anything you want to add before we wrap up and I said you know actually I do and so uh, and, and so I said you know and we had all the union uh, presidents there uh, Mullins and, and Pat Lynch and and, um, and uh, Roy Richter and at the time and and uh, uh, the detectives and, and Lou Turco, lieutenants and all, they were all there. And, and, and these are folks we deal with all the time, right? And, and so, but I did, I did offer my perspective on, on particularly, this was pretty much focused on Pat, uh, uh, Pat Lynch because it's the PBA, uh, where sometimes uh, too often Pat is making comments about incidents that occur and he gets out ahead of the investigation. And, and so he's, he's making statements that would suggest that the officer did everything right or uh, they didn't do anything wrong or whatever, however he phrases it. But, and I said, you know, when that happens, uh, it, it would be helpful not to do it because when that happens, uh, the, the community hears uh, those words and, and, and really our credibility goes out the window. And, and I said, you know, and the reason is because, well, lots of reasons, but one, one reason is, I said to, to, the, to the group, is that you, the, the citizens don't make a, a distinction between labor and management, all right? So, uh, uh, and, and in much the same way that we get painted with the same brush of, of, of police departments like Minneapolis, or uh, those in, in the, some of these other cases, um, you know, that's, you know, that's them, it's not us, but we, we get painted with that brush. And so essentially what I was saying to, to them was, you know, it'd be, 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 be helpful uh, since you say, you know, Pat always says, I'm take, these are my cops and, and I gotta take care of them. 
And I reminded them, I said, well, they're your cops, but they're also our cops. I mean, we recruit them, uh, we hire them, we train them. And, and, um, and if, we, if we all have their best interests at heart, the bottom line is if the, if the community is suspect of, of, of us because we get out ahead of investigations and, 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 and suggest somehow that the officers haven't done anything wrong before that investigation uh, is completed, you're really doing our cops a disservice because they're the, they're the ones who are in the radio cars and responding to the jobs and so forth. So um, now I didn't get any, uh, I wasn't expecting a response from the unions, uh, I, you know, uh, at, but I didn't care. I, I thought it was um, helpful for me to, 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 to share with them my particular perspective on, on, that, on, that, on that particular point. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to come back to the issue of training, which I know is near and dear to your heart. Um, by the standards of some other countries, at least, uh, training of uh, police officers in America, including New York City, um, is somewhat short. Um, and there's also reports that newly minted police officers coming out of the academy, which appears to do a, a, a good job in the first instance of training them, are met with uh, a whole new culture in the precinct, which says, ah, forget about what you learned in the academy. Uh, this is how it really is on the street. Is there a way to counter that? Would you recommend lengthening the training period or lengthening the probationary period and have recurring training periods in the course of a back and forth between the precinct uh, and the academy? Or are there other ways in which you think training could be improved? Well, you know, I think, Rick, I, I disagree with your premise to begin with, which is that somehow we're short um, and somehow that the culture is such that our officers, uh, that, that is uh, uh, a, um, uh, I think, a myth now. It, it, there was a time when that was true, and it may even be true in some places, uh, but it is certainly not the prevailing, uh, you know, that's not the way the winds blow. Uh, and for our officers. And I think, yeah, we are a majority minority department. We've, we've enhanced our uh, the diversity in the agency. Um, but we also, uh, when it comes to training, uh, we are, I mean, if you speak to our other departments and, and you speak to our colleagues across the globe, not just across the country, um, when it comes to uh, our policies and our practices and our training, um, in areas like discipline or in areas of use of force um, and how many times we fire our weapons um, in, in a variety of, of areas. Um, we are, you know, basically we rewrote our, our, our use of force policies uh, in, in, in the last two and a half years. Um, and again, we were, we, we, we built into that a whole new form to, to collect data. I mean, we were very interested in collecting data uh, and making that data available. I mean, the, the, the country, uh, I, uh, the, the FBI has been trying to do that for years as part of, you know, in, in very much the same way that, that they collect uh, the data for the index crimes and so forth. Um, and then NIBRS is still trying to get off the ground, I think. But for the most part, um, you know, we, we, our standards are pretty high um, um, and we, we get good grades uh, from some of the accreditation uh, boards and folks. And so, um, we do focus really clearly on giving our officers the training and it's not just training in the recruit school, but very much in, in the, in the in-service. Um, once people graduate, as I said to you, we, we've enhanced the amount of training, uh, significantly, uh, for the express purpose of, of re reminding officers, uh, both in terms of tactics, but also in terms of, of, of use of force, de-escalation. Uh, you know, the notion of fairness and equity and procedural justice, all of those things are not just labels, but we build those concepts into the lessons that the officers get, uh, because I expect that that's what we need. And, and um, the, the new academy, as I said, has helped immeasurably. Uh, it's state-of-the-art facility. And when I opened it in 2015, um, you know, we, we invite the community into to the building, uh, but we also um, uh, have a mock environment there. So we enhance the amount of scenario based training that we do because it is, it is really um, very much more effective uh, than the classroom lecture. 
uh, where officers get to actually uh, engage in and, and, and run through exercises uh, that puts them in the, in, in, in the space similar to what it would be on the street um, and, and allows them to, um, to, to really build some muscle memory about car stops and how those things happen and so forth. So, so I, our training, as I said, um, I think is very effective. I th we, we, we give them, we built a field training program. Officers, when they leave the academy, get six months of field training uh, at, the, at the precinct level where they are. Uh, and even before they go out, I built in, a, we freed up uh, in, in, in terms of the curriculum, we freed up uh, and, and screened it and reviewed all the curriculum and really uh, took out a lot of, of, of uh, material that was no longer relevant. And uh, as a result, freed up days so that we could send officers out before they graduated, once they had their, their firearms training for an orientation to become familiar with the, the, uh, the precinct. And then once they graduate and go to the precinct, they work with citizens from that particular precinct community who will introduce themselves, take them around, uh, give them a sense of what the culture in the community is and so forth. So, so it's a, you know, it's, I think we, we have a model that works well. Uh, and, um, and uh, you know, it, it is, I think, producing results in terms of, 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 of officers um, as they do their jobs. And, and are we perfect? Absolutely not. And, and what I do, I really worry about having more and more uh, of our officers really, um, uh, you know, adhere to the rules and so forth. That is, that's always a, a challenge, I think, in some cases, to just remind people. And it's not because they, they don't want to. I think as new things, as new in information comes up, um, new training around body on cameras, and it takes a while for, it's a learning curve. And so, uh, you, you want people to become acclimated to whatever the new procedures are, whether it's, uh, you know, not, not only firearms training, but use of, of other less lethal uh, equipment, or we give them training in, um, in, in um, basic life support. Uh, you'll see officers, if you watch videos that we, that we release, um, even performing, uh, uh, putting, placing tourn tourniquets on, on individuals uh, and so forth. So, so I think, you know, we, we, when it comes to training, I think we are, if you speak to some of the national police organizations, IACP, PERF, um, uh, Police Foundation and others, uh, they often are, uh, you know, engaged with us and use us as examples for purposes of what's happening elsewhere uh, around the country. And, and we share, and, and, and that's not to say we, we know everything because we will, we will, you know, certainly borrow, um, uh, things that we learned from other departments and agencies that have been, that's been tested. Great. We're coming towards the end of our time, but I did get two questions from uh, uh, our attendees, uh, two people who had the same question, and that is to, to ask you to comment on uh, uh, how, uh, what your take is on how the police handled the recent protests uh, in New York City. Sure, sure. I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, this, 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 un we were in uncharted territory um, as a result of COVID. Um, and then certainly, um, you know, Mr. Floyd's murder, I think was a flashpoint, no doubt, um, and, and, and uh, for the country, uh, for all the reasons we know, and, 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 uh, and certainly can understand. Protests, we, you know, New York City, we handle thousands of protests um, every year, um, and been doing it um, uh, for, for year after year after year, the major events. And so we're, we're pretty good at training our officers and crowd control and all the other uh, uh, necessities for, for handling uh, demonstrations. I will say that, that the, um, uh, these demonstrations, uh, the protesters uh, were peaceful in many instances, and those protests uh, were fine. Uh, uh, at the same time, there were people who hijacked some of those protests, um, and and I don't have to go into details. You know, you saw the, the Molotov cocktails, you saw the bottles, uh, water bottles filled with cement, you saw officers being struck, and you saw police officers engaging in conduct that they shouldn't have been engaged in as well. Um, 
and 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 um, in those instances, uh, most of those instances were on camera, and I will tell you that uh, that we've, you know, in cases where we decided that that the discipline was necessary, and and that's true in many of those instances. At least it required a, a hard look from us. Um, we took that action, and so um, some would have you believe that that somehow. There, there was, you know, that the police were the villains there, and I would suggest to you that that certainly was not the case. Um, and um, and I and 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 I thought that our officers, in many instances, in some instances, um, with the looting, and certainly um, um, with um, with the the, the the instances where they were attacked, uh, handled themselves, I thought quite well, um, and. Um, you know that's the nature of police work, and so you, you try to deal with and control the crowd. Um, but we learned some lessons as well in in terms of, of our tactics uh, and 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 just deployment and personnel, how we use our personnel, um, which which was which was very helpful. But we had to also pivot to some of the protests that took the protesters who were well organized and and they had a particular purpose in mind of. Of preventing people from being arrested, and they had all of these. They was doing surveillance and and, and so forth. Um, so it wasn't as if this was these were um, uh, peaceful protesters, but these were people who who had other things on their mind, and 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 very often that was that was violence and destruction. Um, and we have you know the vehicles being burned and windows being broken and so forth. So. You know, it's um, and it's unfortunate that we that we 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 ended up in this space, uh, and um, you know we will you know continue to to do the job and do it as as we train our officers. They will do it the way it's supposed to be done, uh, and and again, uh, they all know that uh, if there's if there's if they engage in conduct that is um, not appropriate, that that we will that they will have to answer for it. Thank you, Ben. Well, as you know, we could keep this conversation going for at least for another hour. Um, yeah, yeah. My list of questions uh, c continues, but I think we're kind of at the end of the time period that we uh, had, uh, had set for this conversation. I want to thank you again for your uh, willingness uh, to participate and your forthrightness. Uh, we all know that you've had a splendid and an admirable career, uh, not only in the New York City Police Department, but elsewhere. Uh, you are uh, uh, the model of a, uh, a public servant, and uh, we all uh, greatly admire and respect uh, that service. And uh, we wish you the very, very best as, we, uh, as you go forward in the difficult challenges that you have ahead. Uh, with that, I'll turn the floor back over to who's ever supposed to take it from here. Okay, Rick. Rick, thank thank you very much, Rick. It's a pleasure, really, uh, having this conversation with you. And I and can I just say one more thing that that uh, you know, to the extent that 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 folks who have part you know been part of the, the you know the the, the audience, um, you know, listen, if you if you want to know what we're doing, you know, it's uh, I'm happy. I'm you know, as I said, I'm always open to. Having, I invite people to see what we're doing, to come to the academy, to see the training. I mean, right now, we, we training is, is pretty much on hold. Uh, but when we get back to some modicum of normalcy, uh, that offer still remains. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity uh, to, to, uh, to share with you and, and for your, your, your questions. Uh, Commissioner, Randy, I just... be well. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I just wanted to thank you so much for being here. That was so interesting. And, and Rick, for moderating uh, the conversation. It was really appreciated. And Commissioner, keep, keep doing uh, God's work. You know, we, we, uh, we, we, love, we, we love our city. And of course, we want to have a, a, a safe city. So I uh, thank you for all you do. Um, before we close tonight, I just wanted to remind everybody um, our virtual uh, annual uh, dinner is uh, on October the 22nd. We need your support more than ever. 
So we hope that you will provide your uh, personal and financial support to what is our biggest fundraiser every year. Um, thank you for your support again. And I want to remind the CU and CUF board members who are on the call, we will be immediately going into a board meeting um, at the conclusion of this meeting. So uh, click into your uh, Zoom for that meeting and we will start immediately. Thank you, everybody. Be well, stay safe. God bless. Thank you. Thank you.